Hi, welcome to valuationpodcast.com, a podcast and video series about all things related to business and valuation. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I provide valuation and mediation services based in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, we're actually kind of building upon a prior discussion that we had, but we're going to be discussing the pandemic economy and divorce with Josh Schiltz and Patrick Kilbane. Josh's practice is really focused on complex financial matters and disputes. He's a frequent lecturer on forensic accounting topics and has been involved with hundreds of forensic investigations dealing with matters involving personal and business disputes, as well as the identification and mitigation of fraudulent activities. He's also provided expert testimony in commercial and family matters surrounding business valuations, economic damages, fraud, and other um, disciplines having to do with accounting and economics. He's a forensic valuation expert and offers tax advice in the state of Florida. Pat, on the other hand, is a wealth advisor with nearly a decade of experience in helping clients coordinate their wealth management plans. He's also general counsel for Ullman Wealth Partners. He is the director of Divorce Advisory Group, where he assists, guides, and supports clients before, during, and after they begin the divorce process. He helps high net worth clients make financial decisions at all stages of the divorce process by using his family law experience, uh, his wealth management experience, and his certified divorce financial analyst designation. One thing that I think we all know pretty well is this concept of a financial neutral. And that's where we all come in. And you talked about a little bit of what our role was with the court but, you know, in a lot of these situations, we're bringing in financial people, a lot of, you know, business valuation people are one of them, but a lot of times it's financial planners, it's wealth managers, it's people that understand the money aspect. It could be accountants and things like that. But does that role change if you get into mediation? Because a lot of things are moving towards getting done outside of the court, right? And I think that couples have a lot more options than they did in the past um, mm. because the court system is kind of clogged up, you know? So Patrick, as being a CDFA and, and um, you know, how does your role, how do you get involved with those people getting divorced? And do you handle divorces of your own clients? Yeah, so really interesting. I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a lawyer by by training, so of course I'm very leery of conflicts of interest just by nature because it's a, it's a serious issue that we have to deal with in um, you know when you're representing somebody and in a divorce there's an inherent conflict of interest, right? I mean the, the parties have you know competing interests, but you know from the financial side. We really don't have those con, uh, conflicts of interest when we're trying to help a couple, um, you know, split their assets up. And, you know, there are a number of times where, you know, a, a referral source will say, listen, I know this couple, they're very amicable. Will you sit down with them and help them come up with a settlement? Absolutely. And I don't think, although, you know, if, if that, you know, amicableness breaks down and they end up litigating nothing would prevent me from you know working with one side or the other um you know there there have been times where you know i met with somebody and then they decided for whatever reason that they didn't want to have a financial person involved now remember i don't have any conflict of interest and then the other side will call me and say i want you to be on my side and i say I would love to do that. However, I don't feel comfortable doing it because I already talked with, you know, your strange spouse, but that's just the way that I do business. And um, I, look, from a litigation standpoint, when you're hired as an expert witness, I mean, there's an expectation that you are going to do the job that the person that hires you, that they want you to do, but you've got to do it within the bounds of advocacy and, what you can, you know, raise your hand and swear is, is, you know, a, an appropriate way to do your job. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that I'm able to help my clients get the results they get and achieve fair settlements because, you know, I don't take extreme positions when I testify as an expert witness. And maybe that costs me some business sometimes, but I, I think 
as an officer of the court, as a lawyer, I want to present candid testimony to the court. Yeah, I, I, the only difference to me, because I learned this a long time ago and I completely respect, and I hope other people that give expert testimony hear this and hear what Patrick was saying. It doesn't have to be a nerve wracking job. Okay. Except the fact that your job is for a trained attorney to try and point out. But if you follow your standards and your methodologies and you stay true to yourself, you're not going to get into situations like Patrick's talking about. And I also think that you may lose some business, but I'll tell you what, I think in the long run, it'll work out just fine because of the respect factor. Um, I, I've done that and, you know, there's probably some people that don't like it. And uh, I don't think it's hurt me in any way. I, I, I do think that as a neutral, the role changes because now the number of chefs in the cook has doubled. And so you're managing two clients, husband and wife or whatever, as well as their two attorneys. And so instead of having one expectation, there's two expectations. Um, but again, if you follow your path and you can explain your story, um, so it shouldn't be an issue. Josh, I want, I want to, I want to jump in and say one thing real quick. So, you know, for all of you who are expert witnesses or thinking about expert witnesses, just think of your title. You are the expert. You are the person who is in that courtroom who knows the most about your subject matter. Okay. So the person asking you questions, whether they hired you or whether they're cross-examining you, you know, your answers are only going to help the trier of fact understand the subject matter okay mm -hmm. so you don't have to feel like you're being attacked it is just your opportunity to further clarify your message and what i used to tell all my expert witnesses is i mean you all produce these reports that are 80 and 90 pages they're very fancy they're very impressive they have tables and charts and they're they're they look like they're very expensive to produce but what I tell them all is I want you all to boil that 80 or 90 page report down to a one page executive summary. And you assume that the judge, I'm sure she's a very smart person, but let's say she was a career district attorney or you know prosecutor uh, in, a, in a even more. And that person just got rotated in to hear a, a, a business valuation issue in a divorce case. They're smart, but they don't have any experience or this may be their first dance with this issue. So keep it very simple. I mean, if you were going to use terms of art and phrases, I, I mean, that that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I agree. Not, 